Let's get started and uh, uh, wade together into the confusion. Um, and uh, a couple of comments to begin. Um, this is your talk. If you want it to go in a different direction, let me know and um, I'll take it wherever you want to go if I know something about it. Um, uh, secondly, um, I had structured this more as kind of the big picture versus the current events kind of stuff, you know, this was gumming memories kind of stuff 10 years in. Um, but um, if you want more emphasis on what's happening currently, we can emphasize that piece. Um, um, I do have four or five slides on the future, so that will be part of this no matter what. Um, and then uh, I'm going to try a demo just so that it can crash. Um, you know, you don't know it's you know you know it's state of the art if it doesn't work. Um, but this is the first time I've tried a demo of this of the software that we've been developing as part of the Enstic process on a consent manager, you know, basically a privacy. Um, uh, mechanism. So with all of that, again, just a um, small crowd. I'm thankful I'm not in the ballroom where the same size crowd looks really tiny. <laughs> um, um, and um, um, again, um, please, if you have a question, even you can, um, just, just jump right in. We have years together to, uh, to, to ameliorate the pain. Um, so what I was going to do is a slide on forging the elements, a slide on the decade of deployments, and then start to emphasize a little bit more about where we are now, what we got right, what we got wrong, um, where we need to go, and then a few observations at the end. And again, um, a customizable talk. So, forging of the federal uh, 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 of the key federating elements. Um, the academy is really powerful. It has been able to move an entire base of technology and community forward in ways that didn't happen previously. So some of us are veterans of PKI and years of federal initiatives, and they got basically nowhere. And then along comes the compelling need of the academy to work together. And because of that power, we were able to convince folks, yeah, we could get this off the ground. And we were able to convince folks that your CIO and your provost will approve of this kind of stuff, um, all because we needed to talk to each other across institutions more than we needed to talk to each other within the institution. Chemists and physicists never talk at the same uh, institution except to argue at faculty meetings about office space, but um, chemists at one campus need to talk to the chemists at the other campus, and that was very powerful. And then we lucked out well, we, we, we chose carefully, and some of the folks who were in this room were there at the, uh, at the start. Um, we got the right use cases. We got the library's use case, which was um, 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 pretty much uh, privacy and anonymous, uh, uh, anonymous access where appropriate. We got the science use case, which was rich in identity, because you're not going to get to my super collider unless you know who you are. And then we got the in-between case of collaboration, which said, I don't need to know who you are, Josh, but I want to know that you're a member of a particular class. Or that no, academic class, which is <laughs> a social class. Um, and um, or I need to know that um, you're a member of a certain group, and then suddenly collaboration can happen. And it was that last one where I needed to pass attributes, not identity, not, not a but something in between that gave us the, uh, the, the grist for the protocol base. So we had the three driving use cases. A bunch of usual suspects began developing key elements. This is around 2000 at Stone Suit meetings and beyond. Um, and the first thing we did, we worked on the schema because that was going to require cross-campus agreement among, um, and again, the venue we were working in was the Big Dog Universities and the Big Dog Universities um, uh, had their own opinions, and so we um, we had to uh, we had to start the consensus process about what we were going to pass long before we had a tool for passing. And it took us three damn years to come up with the schema. Um, what do you mean by affiliation? What do you mean by membership? All of that conversation we got to close. We built some software along the way, Sample and Shib. Um, 
And then we made a key um, um, distinction that the rest of the world is now catching up to, um, which is that we were going to be a multilateral relationship. It wasn't me outsourcing my travel to a third party or me outsourcing my accounting to another third party. It was me collaborating with all of the partners in academia. And so I couldn't hardwire in things. I had to use metadata to drive everything. Key distinction. Um, and that led to a federated operator. And then we uh, decided that uh, um, we were going to align and influence others in the way that academia always thinks it can influence others. And in fact, this time we, we, we were able to do that. And so we joined uh, international communities, some standards communities, uh, the US government, etc. cetera. I want to give credit to the various folks that supported this. I want to give a lot of credit to the campuses that were involved in all of this stuff. And I want to give a special moment to Bob Morgan, who without his mumbling vision, we wouldn't have gotten um, anywhere in this. So around 2004, we deployed in common. Um, and federations began about the same time in Switzerland, the UK, uh, um, Scandinavia. Um, and that immediately drove us to align our practices, our schema. We didn't really get too great on the alignment of schema. So for example, our schema has faculty, student, and staff as affiliations. The UK has no word faculty faculty are part of the staff. So they said, oh, well, what are we going to do with this faculty word? And we said, well, you know, don't use it. What do we do when we receive one? Mumble. Um, and so um, we found footing, we found business models. Um, we had to make this work. And we had to change the paradigm that it was going to be point-to-point -point authentications into a multilateral path. And then it happened. It happened, it's still happening, exponential growth, I got the usual chart in there, US and international. And along the way, because it was happening, and it was happening pretty rapidly, we had to reinvent lots of key pieces um, to meet the scaling sets of issues. Initially, our metadata bundle was about, um, um, I don't know, uh, six megabits, uh, sorry, six kilobits. We're now up to 15 megabits of metadata in income. And that's too big, and so we're moving to a dynamic mechanism for distributing. Um, we adopted, uh, it was adopted by other verticals. Some verticals are natural for multilateral federation, the multiple listing service. Oh my God, did they look at this and go, oh, that's our world. If we have to deal with all these other brokers around the world, how cool. Um, they run shit. Um, the financial industries, law enforcement, the biggest federation in the world, if you haven't noticed, is in law enforcement. It's called NIEF, N-I-E-F, the national, I don't even know what the acronym stands for. 6,000 federal law enforcement agencies, state and local too, actually, um, exchanging lots and lots of data. I could show you this schema. It's terrifying. I'd have to shoot you all afterwards. We have in our schema, I think now a grand total of seven attributes. They have 300. When I asked them, how many of those get populated, they said, oh, around six or eight. I'm going, well, you know, <laughs> what good is it if people aren't populating those attributes and relying parties are expecting those attributes to be farmer, et cetera. And then along the way, social identity um, came along. Um, we all have Gmail accounts, Yahoo, et cetera. And the emerging business model is that you are the product, you know that. It's your eyeballs that they want. And, and they sell your eyeballs to the advertisers. And just remember what the right structure here is in relationship. You're not paying anything, so you're not a customer. Um, um, and it's almost ubiquitous coverage. I, I'll, I'll just mention, I'm not going to get into the uh, protocol wall, wars, but um, a lot of this stuff is around um, not SAML per se. We worked with the developers of this stuff. It's Open ID Connect, for those of you who know the, the buzzwords. We worked closely with them so that they would harvest the lessons that we had had as they transited from SAML, which is a web-centric protocol, to JSON, which works so well on mobile. And in fact, one of the things we did wrong was we didn't anticipate how 
major mogul was going to be. And so if any of you try to log on into a federated environment um, using your phone, and I do this a lot, I'm sitting there trying to blow up the little screen so I can type my username and password. I'd sure like a native client that knew the platform I was on and gave me all the bells and whistles. That's what Jason can give you. That said, we have um, um, uh, pretty good interoperability. So where are we now? Internet identity is a big deal. Um, to consumer companies, to government, to academia, or enterprises. I'm going to cover just one slide of normalization of terms. I'm going to talk about the integration of the technologies. I'm going to talk about the lack of governance. Um, and then a couple of challenges in this. And then I'm going to despair over the fact that this has changed a large part of the world, but scholarly identity still lags. Why is that? So it's a big deal. Our RD federations, uh, lots of hundreds of millions of users, thousands of service providers, Google and Yahoo and their ilk um, are dominant industries. The federal government has invested a lot in this. Um, and I'll just mention that um, here's where we're headed. I'll come back to this in a bit. But um, one of the great powers of federated identity is to leverage multi-factor authentication. So if you don't have federated identity and service providers go, you know, they can pass with the pass A, I'm going to go to two-factor authentication. Yes, yeah, Steve, here's a second factor. And then the next vendor comes along and goes, Steve, here's a second factor. Steve, here's a second factor. And suddenly Steve has a bandolier <laughs> full of second factors. And he's sitting there in the 60 seconds he has allotted to give the second factor to figure out which one is the right one. If we can replace that bandolier with a single second factor, the service providers like that because they don't have to pay that expense anymore. The institution likes it because it's suddenly manageable. And it wasn't expensive because the second factor turned out to be a phone. Or it turned out to be some other mechanism that you happen to have. And so there was no real capitalization cost other than the license. Um, I'll get back to the attribute based access controls in a minute. So here's a, this is a stale map of RNE federations worldwide. The coverage is much bigger now, especially in Africa. Um, I wonder what privacy management means in China. That said, the Chinese have invited me to go there, so I might find out or I might not come back. Um, and then if you look in, in um, Europe, you can see the coverage is complete. Um, uh, basically, everybody has a federation. So it has worked. Um, here's an old chart of the growth curve of in common. This, this was, uh, um, hasn't been updated in a while. Um, you can see the exponential. You can see the linear growth in the um, um, IDPs, the exponential growth in the SPs. Um, we have now concluded some structures that are going to bring in the entire UC, sorry, Cal, California Community Colleges. Um, and then there's some other things coming along. We're going to see an exponential growth in IDPs to be followed shortly by the fact that the chart will become utterly meaningless because we're not going to have a bundle anymore that we can count things in. We're going to have a dynamic service that hands you exactly what you need about the relying party when you need it. And so it's going to be a harder metric to, um, to uh, work with in that. Uh, social identity, um, you know about all this stuff, works well with mobile devices. They're working hard on better security. They're not working on privacy. Um, if you went to the earlier talk that uh, Peter Brantley um, and others gave, you know that, this, that it's gone. Um, but we're working on it. Um, they do statistical identity bonding to know who you are. If you, um, I've gotten, I had to erase my eyeballs afterwards, but I got a chance to look at the mechanism that Google uses for anti fraud And they bring in so many factors about, well, where is this coming from? How recently was your last login? What's the speed of your key clicks? What's your MAC address? Oh, so many factors that go in. The authentication is the least of the issues in this. It's all the circumstantial evidence, and they do a really good job. So they come up with a pretty good assurance. And one of the tussles I've seen over the last few years is they go to the federal government and they go, 
U.S. government, you've been working on levels of assurance for a while. That's how we do our confidence building. And the government looks at that and they go, well, you know you're working with the same person every time, but you still don't know who that person is. And that's the key distinction. So they, they can um, do that. All the attributes are self-asserted by the user, and the fact that this is ubiquitous, and the fact that it's a promiscuous attribute release policy makes the Google identity very compelling to the world. And we see lots of scientists, I'll come back to this, um, who are trying to use their institutional identity. And the institution goes, oh, we're not going to release attributes. We're a little concerned about FERPA or HIPAA or new technology or old technology. And then the user goes, damn it, I'm going to go to Google, which is going to spill everything to the, to the relying party. It's all self-assertive, but Google has its mechanisms to release. We'll come back to that in a bit. I just want to, I'm going to be using three words um, I frequently, just want to clarify them. This is now normative technology, uh, um, nomenclature. Um, you know who you are. Again, identifiers are unique values um, that are tied to you, but they often offer privacy instead of identity. So one of the key things that SHIB does out of the box is not to release identity. You go to a website, and it gives them a 32-bit opaque number and says, here's a state number. You can hold this for state. We're never going to give that number to any other site. We're going to give every other site that this user goes to a different number so you can't correlate. We're not going to ever use this number again. So it's only a stateful identifier. Uh, so it's opaque but stateful. And it's opaque and non-correlating. We do all these wonderful things, and it works. Now you then go to a screen and you inside your service provider, you type in all your personal information because you're going to get a, a rubber squeeze toy at the end of that. That was your choice to do that. So it goes. It's the attributes that we're really interested in. They provide privacy, they provide access control, and they provide scale. And there's two kinds of attributes. There's basically the verified one and the self-asserted one. And um, Generally, verified is really important in certain cases, and self-asserted, often you know what your preferred language is. And one of the favorite attributes in Europe is preferred language. So you might be Dutch, but you know that when you see technical documents, you want it in English, just because the translations are imperfect. So preferred language is a big attribute, and you know that. Friends, displayed names. Um, and then, um, uh, the attributes unlock all the doors. So, um, everything is coming together technically. Um, the uh, SAML and OpenID Connect are now tied together through these social to SAML gateways. Um, and we operate some. Since, since, since you invited interruptions and questions, can I, may I? Uh, you couldn't stop yourself, Steve, if you no, wanted to. Right, okay. Go, go. Go back a slide. Now that might be harder. Ah. Hello. Well, ah. So um, the verified attributes, verified by the identity provider, by the identity provider. Or, so for example, mm, um, if I if I use my Colorado identity, it knows what classes I'm enrolled in because that's part of the um, data that's fed into the institutional directory. Um, so that's the identity provider example. The attribute provider, well, my citizenship. Who's authoritative on my citizenship? Ultimately, it should be the State Department who issues passports. And then, since most campuses have a mechanism by a SEVIS for looking at a passport and ingesting that data, and, you know, I become an attribute authority of second hand that way. The third party verifier is one of the more interesting business opportunities that's come up. So one of the other efforts that spun up inside NSTIC is an attribute verification service. And what it would mean is um, I go to a relying party, I want to buy that doodad, I want to have it shipped here, and the relying party goes, what's the likelihood that this shipping address is really connected with that person? 
and they go to a third party verifier. These, these exist today. And say, and by the way, you hit a consent button on that screen that says, okay to verify this information. But, but all they have is an opaque ID. Oh, no, they will then pass a, um, the name that you typed in, the address, and it'll go out and it'll verify that this name will be associated with this address. The thing that's very interesting about this marketplace is who's in it. So who's, who's offering verification services today? U.S. Postal Service. They might stay at the shop, but they typically don't have fresh information. Fresh is Google will offer verification. Where did they get the information from? Frankly, Scarlett, we won't tell you. Um, who else is third-party verifiers? Well, um, Equifax. Wait, doesn't Equifax have a service to do this? And yes, for ten dollars, I can pay as a reliant, as, as, as a vendor. I can pay Equifax to get verification, and I get back a whole lot of other information from Equifax that I didn't care about. And so, what I really care about is I just want this one verification. So Equifax is eating its own business model. And going from a, you pay for ten dollars worth of verification to you pay a buck and quarter for verification. But the process model then is you use the term relying party, which is good because now we know who we're talking. So, so I'm I'm I, I need this relying party to go out and get some set of attributes about me in order to conduct the transaction that I'm doing, and somehow this relying party. Oh, you filled it in on the screen. It didn't get it from your... You, you went shopping. You filled out name, address, etc. You filled out a bunch of attributes about that name. So the line part of the process that, that, that got There was no the transport from the identity okay. provider. That's, okay. that's the key piece. Because the identity provider, especially if it was an institution, went, why am I going to release this information to a third? Why do I even have it? Excellent point. It, it, it invites privacy spills. Having that information. Yeah. By the way, um, that marketplace is failing. Um, the price points turn out to be anywhere between eighty-five cents and a buck and a quarter. And no one, no one who goes there knows whether if you pay a buck and a quarter, you get better strength of verification. Um, so, and why is it failing? Because users haven't been comfortable clicking on the consent button to go get that verification. And if I'm making a sale to Surge, and he's going to turn away because there's an extra click, I'm not going to go for the verification. So it's very interesting to watch what could have been a very interesting market start to get stymied by one extra click. Can I also ask you a question here about these opaque data? So, I mean, the reality is you're not going to want to know. You, you want to know essentially the person's use for ID. Because everything's going to be some sense tied to that. I mean, if I go in to some system and it bounces me back to Princeton or whatever to log in, and I have my user ID and my password, almost any place I'm going to is going to log back in. That's, I mean, you don't really Not content that. providers. They're going to want to know that you're a member of the Princeton. No, but this is going to start, they're going to want to know locally. I'm talking to Surge. They're going to, in fact, say, welcome, Surge. I mean, they, they almost always want they need an opaque identifier, particularly one that changes or isn't steady. How are they going to engage in extended conversation with you? How do they maintain You steady? won't. How do they right. You can't get state that way. You can't get any of that stuff. But, but look who you, you know, look, through your, look, through your, look through the transactions that you engage in and categorize them by whether they need to be stateful yeah. or stateless. And then whether or not, even if they need to be stateful, whether or not they need to be identity rich or not. And you're going to discover, especially in the community that we live in, that state is really desirable. Identity is second. State gives you the continuity of experience that you want to have, the ability to pick up the search at home, all that other stuff. But none of that needs identity. If you believe in open shelves, I want to be able to do browse open content. Um, so. One of the, so we have these SAML to social gateways and these social to SAML gateways. Um, how many people know that Yahoo, about a year ago, started reassigning email addresses? So if you're using, if you're a reliant party that's using an email address as an anchor for identity, 
You could be dealing with somebody else. When Yahoo made this decision, because they were running out of all the good email addresses, it turned out John Smith was used a lot of times, as it were. When Yahoo made this decision, there was a huge uproar. And Yahoo said, thank you, here's the bird, we're going to do this. So if you're going to count on, so we're running a social disarmament gateway. We come, comes in a, a Yahoo identity, and we put it into a SAML packet. We throw away a lot of the attributes that Yahoo gave us, because frankly, A, we don't trust them, they're self-asserted. B, what are we doing passing them on? And then, as we learned with Brown University, and, and it's the same issue that Steve raised, I don't want that information to be stored because I have a, a, a liability if I have a data breach. So one of the things that Brown is using the social disarmament gateway for is to bring in all the parents and all the alumni who no longer have accounts into the Brown world, and this is good, and CMU is using the social disarmament gateway so that parents can look at student accounts, student bills, etc. And the, uh, Carnegie Mellon didn't want to create new accounts as parents, so they said, use your billboard. And we're going to throw away half the information Google gives us as you come in, because we don't want to hold So there are some, no, there are no technology issues in this space, but it's fraught with policy issues. And every institution that is brought into the social disarmament gateway, and it's really attractive, has to go through this process of, what information do I want to accept from these various identity providers? How comfortable am I believing that this is still the same e person behind this email address as it was six months ago? Um, so the importance of payloads versus protocols. Nice thing about the OpenID Connect people is they're using the same exact payloads and they're using very equivalent metadata, though it's JSON-based. So governance. Um, the U.S. government, just a few blocks away, <laughs> has been trying this for years. It's generally been led by a GSA or by NIST. It hasn't really worked. Their one accomplishment has been these high assurance HSPD trail cards based upon George Bush's uh, uh, um, uh, requirement a while ago. And even there, I'm watching, so they've issued these high assurance cards. And how do I get anonymous, anonymous access from a high assurance card? So there's all these people who work in, in, in various uh, industries who want to use their identities outside those industries. They have these HSPD 12 card, no attributes, rich in identity. I want to go shopping. I, 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 maybe I need some attributes, my preferred language. I certainly don't want to give out my identity until I click for purchase. So I'm watching a very interesting activity of downscaling the high assurance credential into functioning in a world with privacy, et cetera. Um, the citizen to government space has gone through a federated model. And um, when the federal government started this, um, there was a major program. I'm a, I'm a recipient of it called NSTIC. Um, and it's done a couple of quick finesses. One finesse is, who does it apply to? Well, basically the federal government can only apply, can only have citizen to government or business to government entities. They puffed up big and said, hey, we're going to try to influence the marketplace. The last few meetings of this group, no Google, no Yahoo, they're not showing up. These are the guys that brought you back doors in their crypto. So I can imagine why they would want to why Google and Yahoo would want to be showing up at the Quick sidebar. So I know, so Steve raised a very interesting and delicate point, which was there were some weak standards in crypto that were created with key government personnel chairing the international standards committees. Were they under instruction? I know the person who led the effort, he was not under instruction. They just missed it. There was nothing more than that. It's all optics, though. Yes, it is all offense, and this, right, I, I can tell you about, uh, I, I, I've actually seen little boxes that the U.S. government puts into the switch rooms, 
on the overseas transports. In fact, of the offenses the government made over the last few years, the one that was most scurrilous in the eyes of at least Silicon Valley was that Google was not getting clear pipes from the vendors. That all of the pipes that Google was using between a Google data center here and a Google data center here, that pipe was sniffed. And I know the person who puts the boxes in the rooms and he says, you put this box in right next to the box from the UK government, right next to the box from the French government, right next to the box from the, all the other governments. And the US government is just certain that their box is faster and better than anybody else's in the properties. So the authority over the marketplace, and then the internationally, it all compounds things. Um, European policy affected by local laws. Is your IP address personally identifiable information? Hmm. The answer is sometimes. If it's assigned dynamically, no. If it's not assigned dynamically, if it's a static IP address, then it is personally identifiable information. So there, the US, the European policy is unless you can presume that the address, unless you can show the address was assigned dynamically, you have to assume it's static, and therefore you have to assume it's personally identifiable information. And the German courts went. That's really weird. We don't believe that. So the European policy affected by local laws. Um, Snowden has deeply affected the marketplace. And finally, the big dogs do what the big dogs want to do. Repurpose uh, personal data, modify search results, change the assignment of email addresses, institute risk-based measures, retain histories, uh, put cookies in. We saw, again, Peter's at the conversations there about what the big dogs do. So, um, impact on scholarly work. Um, boy, we did this, you know, again, Steve and others were there. Uh, we did this because we were going to um, change the way the academy worked. What fools we were. <laughs> it's a tough business to be in to change how the academy works. Um, we've had large impacts on our enterprise, our cloud services, single sign-on, collaboration tools. But when I look at, do we have anybody here who's been involved in any of the federal initiatives around Science CV? It's been a 10-year process. The goal here is so that I, when I create my custom CV for submission of my grant, I can do this expeditiously because you don't ever submit, if you're a big-time researcher, it's never the same CV to the same agency. It's always refreshed. This effort has been going on for a long time. Um, scholarly collection, uh, collections have not been re-engineered access controls. Though I'm really excited, there was a workshop here yesterday that CLI, uh, CLIR and CNI sponsored on um, access to restricted collections, expanding access, fascinating. The collections want to expand. They have some challenges beyond belief. Henry Kissinger gives all of his materials to Yale. Wonderful. There's credit card information in there. There's paper information in there. Henry didn't take those things out, right? You know? Who's going to take that out? Um, but that's separate from the elite. And I heard so much yesterday about lockdown laptops where you can't even take notes, you can't take screenshots. The collection is so restricted that when you leave the room, they go through everything that you had. You know, normally when you leave a library, they might, or when you enter a library, they might check for things. Here it's when you leave this room to make sure that nothing is getting Business models are uncertain. Um, uh, the attribute protective institutions. Any registrars in the room? Um, and then the trailing edge users are uh, hampering progress. And lastly, the catalyst for change are not con connecting with the points of authority. So let me go back to this attribute retentive. Maybe I'm going to step out for a second. And well, I'll get to the uh, consent manager in a second. Let me let me hold that rant for one minute. Challenges in scaling privacy. Um, so the spectrum of user interest. Alan Weston was a researcher for many years in privacy. He went through surveys over 30 years to characterize um, the community at large in terms of uh, 
privacy fundamentalists to the don't cares. Um, got lots of slides about that. Um, it's a very interesting reading. Basically, about a quarter of the people out there are fundamentalists, about a quarter of them don't care, and about a half in the middle want to have some kind of management over privacy. Um, and so, for those of us developing consent managers, and I'll show it to you in a second, the challenge really is to make consent management work across the spectrum of users, and you'll see something that will indicate that. Um, populating, releasing, and using attributes have been very, very hard. Um, international complexities, Spanish surnames. How many fields for surname do you have in your directory for users compared to the number of... And in fact, in different Spanish-speaking countries, which surname becomes dominant? I'm seeing nods here of people who know those, that Chile and Argentina don't work the same way. Um, so if we're trying to say release name, last name, which one are we supposed to do? Um, consent managers have different motives. I'll show you that in a second. And then um, one of the things that we're about to get into as a community is the, um, is the set of determining what are the minimum attributes needed by an application. And we're doing this already globally in one category, research and scholarship. And I'll talk about that in just a second. So consent management. Key dimension of privacy, it's a complex set of issues. Um, I think the term is catching on. Privacy is a vast word. Consent management is really about the release of your information to a third party. It's not about privacy spills. It's not about PCI. It's not about the other things. To give a um, um, the requirements list grows, especially from the Europeans. Um, the worst case is medical information in our medical system. Because the number of third parties who deal with your medical records is going to be huge. And so I hear all the time from the NIH, have consent flow with the information. And I go, lots of problems with that. We don't have to do that technically. Was that the user's intent, was to have consent flow? Because the medical cases are the worst. And then finally, we're dealing with users who, a quarter of them, don't even want to deal with this. There's the consent screen from Google. How many of you used to, your Google identity to go to a third party and use Yeah. Well, oh, I know Google likes white space, but my <coughs> gosh, so much white space. Um, another thing to note is that um, this, you, you just accept, you can't, you can't individually release information. Where's the informed consent? Oh, you want more information? Here's more information. Still small. Still terse. No display of value. Speed release. No revocation capability. You consent once. That's it. You can. You can go to your profile. You can go. You can revoke on an application by application basis access. Right, but you have to do that. Out, out, I know, because, yeah, I got into it. You have to go to user profile. It's, it's not easy. easy but it's you, not easy. It's not easy. Right. Here's the stuff we've been working on. Not, you know, first of all, we're not afraid to use the screen real estate. Secondly, um, we give clear indications on a per attribute basis what's being sent and what's not being sent. We're showing the value that's being released. So you can go, oh my god, that's not the right value. <laughs> we have this little I button for informed consent which is tell me more about this field. Um, and then we have a mechanism, and I'm going to try a live demo in two seconds just to show you, that says managing privacy is a pain in the butt. I've only got a few attributes here. Imagine if I had a whole lot. So I want to be able to not see this screen again for a while, and that always kills my demos because I click on it and I don't want to see it, and then I can't pull it up in the demo until I revoke. Um, so we give you suppression mechanisms. We give you alternate notification, which is just say, send me an SMS message every time attributes get released, every second time. 
infinite capability. So here's where we're going to go into the pit. I'm going to try to do a uh, get to the web browser and see if this works. So now I'm going to try to log into something. I'm going to get an error message. So it goes. It's okay. Um, cookies. Cookies. What I was going to do was I was going to start to manage all the sliders. I was going to show you the suppression mechanism, the alternate kind of stuff. And then I was going to actually get to the application that I was trying to go to. Um, we're setting up a demo site for all of this stuff. It's, what's really fascinating in setting up the demo site is we're looking for applications whose behavior will be different based upon what attributes you use. Wikis are wonderful. I can go to a wiki as an unauthenticated person and see some content. I can go there, but I can't see other content because I haven't authenticated as part of the community. So if I authenticate, I might see more content. If I release some more attributes, I might be able to get into a, a reserved spot on the wiki. What's stunning is how few applications are ready to handle distinct sets of attributes. Memberships, etc. Um, that said, we're finding calendars, we're finding lots of applications that can be that can be tuned to do this, but Clearly, the expectation out there in application land is all or nothing, and we'd like all. So, um, what I want to talk about, I'm not selling privacy lens, I'm selling active end user consent management. So, um, the federal government got confused about this. They started to promote privacy lens as the answer to everything, and it only runs on SHIB. It doesn't run on OpenID Connect, it doesn't run on other kinds of SAML software. But, Enable effective and informed end user consent, give hierarchical information, give fine grained controls, bundles of attributes, allow me to revoke. Um, bundles is because we've learned that certain attributes travel in bundles in the ecosystem. Um, um, have flexible notifications, we talked about a style of presentations. Um, I don't know if you noticed on the, uh, on the Google screen, the little button was marked continue. It wasn't marked yes. It wasn't marked, you know, some kind of affirmative action. Continue. Of course I want to continue. It turns out that if anything is important in the screen, it's that one button. The research shows that that users think more if you just change from continue to something else. Search. Okay, so it's even got a little worse in the latest iteration of the rules off to your interface, you as the application developer can actually design your own uh, um, screen that the user will see when, when your application asks them to authorize you, and you can control what message will go out to the user and exactly what they'll see and what they're agreeing to, what, what they think they're agreeing to, which is remarkable. I'm sure Google did this as a way to be nice to application developers. Right, that's so that their means, customer base. So the experience with right. the, the user would be a very positive user would see this nice welcoming screen and so on and so forth. But you can actually control exactly what that message is. Just remarkable. Thank you for sharing that, sir. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What we got right? Um, the basic model. For again, those of us who were doing PKI for years, it was rigid all the way down. Here's the policy. Your policy has to be a subset of this policy. No torque in the system. Didn't work. Uh, what we used to do is, what we said is that PKI was globally scalable. It just wasn't locally deployable. Federation was clearly locally deployable. Will it globally scale was our concern. That's being answered, um, and yes, it does globally scale. Um, and the other thing we used was the driver of academic collaboration. Going into the provost's office and saying this is going to ease the, um, the pain of the researcher was really important. Getting the right use cases, the protocol and its standardization process. We forked over to Oasis. So we got together March of 99 in um, Tucson. And at a table we said, What's the hardest, most important problem we could solve? We came up with this with a few mumbles along the way. 
um, it was the right use case. We went on uh, um, the, um, the Oasis Standards Group knocked on our door six months later and said, you're doing some interesting work. Move it over to Oasis. We said, multilateral? And they said, no, outsource business travel. And they said, we're going to move this part of the problem over to Oasis. But this is the part that we really can, uh, um, care about, and so we're going we're to continue to work on that. A simple and extensible schema and the focus on the metadata to drive things. Well, we got wrong. We thought it was the web. It was the web for a long time. Now it's all native clients because of, 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 of mobile devices. And so the adaptation of web-based technologies to native clients are Another thing we got wrong was our expectations about various US government activities. So, you know, I heard that Kennedy speech, ask not what, you know. And, uh, and so we thought, he, you know, um, all of these were gonna succeed. None of them really did. And I, I, I'll just tell you that decent people in all these federal government activities, it's just an impossible situation, impossibly complex. Um, the politics are just this. And that privacy issues could be rationally resolved. Um, uh, international issues turned out to be very hard, um, still very hard. Attribute retentive institutions, we've talked about already. Inconsistent user behavior. How could we be so naive? So where do we go from here? Mm, four things to look at. First, um, scalable um, and accessible access control. So um, most of us do access control, especially in um, uh, science communities where you have to be very careful about who's getting there, with a list of identifiers. So it's all identity-based, or gas, IP address. So if it's identifiers, and it's a, it's a Yahoo a, a email address as the identifier, and that got reassigned, a little awkwardness as your scientific results get escaped. Um, so we're trying to move to attribute-based access controls, which says um, a variety of tools can be out there. Um, entitlements, in an entitlement, um, and we use heavily in library space, um, the relying party doesn't want to go through all the attribute issues it's going to pass business logic saying these kinds of users can access this content, library walking users can access that kind of content. Here's my business logic. You compute whether or not somebody is entitled and give me back a yes no value. Nice thing. From the relying party's viewpoint. Um, no consent issue either, because in fact the attributes stayed on them. Um, um, so that's one way of going about it with entitlements, but increasingly it's here's a set of attributes about people and um, uh, uh, use the attributes to determine whether or not they're allowed to get in. Are they a member of the class? Are they a member of this group, um, um, et cetera? Um, let, me see. Uh, let me tell you two things that we got wrong in that space and that we're trying to fix. First of all, um, those of us who were developing this were directory geeks. And so we said, we're going to have a category called is member of. And we're going to put all of your group memberships in is member of. That's fine. Now, you don't want to release all your group memberships. So it's not just releasing this attribute, it's releasing selective values of this multi value attribute. I don't know how to do that. We're working on it. Um, another thing that we did wrong, and this is I don't know if anybody knows this factoid, but Scott Cantor told me this two weeks ago. I can tell who you are by, if you give me three group memberships, I know who you are. Really? I know, I've never heard of that data mining um, stuff, and Scott later admitted that it was a hunch. <laughs> but it's a great factoid that three group memberships can tell. So group memberships may not conceal your identity quite the way we want. Accessibility. This is really important, um, and I'm not going to go into the, this rant, but look up gpii.net if you haven't. It's a set of attributes that help display the content, not just for physical issues, but for all kinds of other compensatory needs you might have. The most interesting of one, 
one of which for me is cognitive problems we're creating, unfortunately, through various military activities, a set of, of, of um, veterans who have cognitive issues. And so they can't do depth first search. So you present tree content and it's not accessible to them. So you need to reformat this as a linear mechanism. How do I do that? Well, actually, tools are being developed to do that. So cognitive disabilities, um, et cetera, um, and there's the GPII net. And I'll just tell you that if we're successful at this, the words privacy and accessibility have never been used in the same sentence. Typically, here's my access, here are my compensatory problems. And so I'm just writing some use cases now for the federal government where um, I want to release to a job service a set of um, physical problems that I have so that I can look at the job ads. But you don't need to know yet that I have a mobility problem. It's when I apply. Wouldn't it be nice if it's not all or nothing, it's either you know, opening the kimono, but I can give you this subset of needs so I can look at the job ad even before I apply. Those things are all tractable now. They were never doable before. That's cool. Um, and then reworking the access codes, uh, controls for restricted materials. Expanding the uh, use of trust-related metadata. Um, so one of the things we've started recently is um, tagging applications in terms of their attribute needs. And we actually, as a federation, go in there and look at the application and go, what attributes do you need? Do you really need those? Because we're going to guarantee to users all over the world that we've done an audit and figured out what the minimum set of attributes is for this application. There'll be a whole set of optional attributes that you'll have the opportunity with those little bars to release as well. But let's see what we can do in terms of this. We called it the RNS tag, research and scholarship. Let me go back to the disconnection that I talked about earlier. Um, we're discovering that a lot of institutions by default do not release much information. And so the physicist is trying to get to the damn site for his physics at CERN, can't get there with his campus identity, goes, hell, I'm going to use my Google identity. It spills everything. Why? Why? So does the physicist ever contact the IT organization and go, yo, release my attributes? Disconnect. Does he ever contact the VP for research and say, your damn IT organization is attribute retentive? No. So in fact, when we were working with the physics community a few weeks ago, they suggested a different tag, R and dollar sinus, because they're bringing in so much money to the campus that certainly the VP for research would not want to blunt their research by not releasing attributes. We're discussing this still, but vanity tags are coming along, sad to say. Um, and so they may be legion, um, consent management support, et cetera, and the business processes to support this. And so there's going to be a third party industry, I hope, that does audits of applications for minimum attribute needs, et cetera. We're beginning to see this. Again, we do this now inside in common. We've certified over 100 applications as RNS. So the work is doable. We engage with the owner of the application. It's usually a phone call or two. It's usually pretty reasonable. We don't want to be in that business at all. We need to find some other industry to do that. Moving from static to dynamic metadata services, um, I talked about that already. I think we talked about um, uh, some of this stuff. So good privacy begins with good security. I'm a big fan now of, of multi-factor authentication. We made it painless enough. It doesn't heal all the wounds out there, but I've seen some phishing attacks recently that was so good that um, I think it's the only way of going. So MFA and federated MFA, lots of leverage. We're going um, into privacy by design as well. I'm not going to get into that. Um, um, we're doing into federation. We're doing federated incident my IDP got compromised. Or somebody did a password reset on an account at Google. 
And of course, the way these are worked is, if I'm gonna do a password reset on my Google account, where's that information gonna be mailed? I can't get to my Google email. But I supplied an alternate email address, which was Yahoo. And so Yahoo immediately finds out that, oh, there's been a password reset happening. I wonder if that person used the same password for their Yahoo account. And so there's a very interesting business coming up called Shared Signals, which is among the big dogs in Silicon Valley to notify each other when accounts get compromised. Interesting space. There's Federated Incident Handling. Um, we are really fascist about your signing key. Is it 2048, Serge, or is it just 10,024? Looks like you have a small signing key. I'm sorry, we're not going to use that. So we're really fanatic about this, but we never ask, by the way, did you patch Heartbleed? <laughs> did you patch anything else? So we're moving to a holistic model of security, which is really pretty good, um, et cetera. Observations. Best slide. Um, internet identity is truly a layer. It's out there, you have to use, you want to use it, you have to use it. Um, identity is really a pretty key um, factor in all of this stuff. But it's not a layer, it's not one crisp protocol, it's a toolkit, you have to assemble it. The use cases are remarkably diverse, but it looks like we can meet every use case we've seen. Um, there's a policy design principle that was founded in 1982 when they were writing old internet protocols. Be conservative um, in what you send, be liberal in what you accept in protocols. Same thing is going to be true with attributes and everything else. Um, the rapid development of the marketplace overtook policy. Um, I think the best example of this and this one is the European cookie policy, which was wrong because it targeted cookies. And cookies wasn't the problem. It was the way cookies were being used that was the problem. And so they just sort of, if, so um, what that says on, 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 a, on a legislative um, basis is that have the policy address what you want to have happen as an operational aspect. Don't talk about the technologies because you could be usurped by so many other things. I think what we saw from um, Peter and the other talks earlier today was that there's a whole wealth of technology, uh, technologies out there being deployed to compensate for some of the European controls. Let me stop there and handle questions. Okay, um, stay tuned folks, this is an interesting world. Um, we're all using identity, um, we're all spilling our attributes left and right. Um, <laughs> Um, may they not get used nefariously along the way. Thank you. Thank you.